Morning, thank you. And uh, is this working? Um, and uh, yeah, pleased to be here and uh, to share with you what I hope is positive because I know everyone's feeling really positive about Brexit. So, uh, and I will apologise for what we've done. It wasn't me. And uh, I didn't vote for Brexit. I, our FD is just coming off six months of counselling as we speak now, actually. So, uh, but we'll deal with it. But we're looking for the opportunities. And, um, and really, what I've come here to talk about is how practically supply chain can help. Uh, it's not the answer to everything, but certainly some of the challenges that uh, if you haven't dealt with them in terms of lead times, we can give you some views on that. Um, and um, in terms of taking some cost out of the supply chain, which I think is going to become quite important. So just briefly what we do, we, we're absolutely on supply chain. 85% of what we do is chilled. So we're at the cutting edge in terms of the demands. We're the last one who gets the kick in if, if it all goes wrong. Um, we're handling about 1.2 million cases of, of product into the supply chain. Everything, all major retailers, uh, whether it be discount or convenience or large retail, uh, around 300 people. So we're at the bottom end of medium size in terms of business. We say we're very reactive and we do the end of line work as well. So we, we often handle the end of line packing operations just to take uh, some of the supply chain pressure off of, uh, off of producers. So Brexit, I've been told not to be political. Um, Politically incorrect, maybe, but uh, it's uh, it, unbelievable what's happened, really. Uh, unbelievable more so because there, there was no plan and still is no plan. And, and, you know, as we keep telling our team, you can only deal with what, what you know and what you can control. So at the moment, we don't know an awful lot and there's not an awful lot we can control. I actually per firmly don't believe that we're going to... I firmly believe that we will not see a full Brexit. I just can't see it happening. Um, it'll gradually uh, pale away, and I think some of the sort of stuff that's really complicated to do will probably just get left on the shelf, and I'm hoping that we do stay in the customs union. Um, the main concerns that people seem to have had is migration uh, and, and Brussels and uh, distrust of politicians, which I think is at the highest level ever. So what do we do about it? From a um, supply chain, dealing with Brexit, so that's the, the theme I've been tasked from a supply chain perspective. You've heard this before, I hope for the best plan for the worst. Um, and this has probably already been said already before, so the, the, the biggest challenge is uncertainty. We're not going to deal with that any time soon. Uh, exchange rate risk, it seems to have done the damage. It's, it's where it is now. Uh, and supply chain disruption, uh, it, that will possibly come if we, don't, if we end up with hard borders. And I, but I can't see us ending up with hard borders either. And, and some of the sensationalism and um, fake news that's been going around about foreign food boycotts. Yeah, there are some retailers pushing for British products. Nothing wrong with that, they, but they are still given the choice. Um, the, you know, business partnerships being challenged, I don't believe that is the case. I mean, the majority of businesses in the UK um, did vote for staying in. Um, so you, you, you are talking to open doors still. Uh, and, and hard borders, it's just not going to happen. I just can't see that happening. And, and underlying all this, you know, businesses deal with businesses, and that's really, we've, we've got to come back to the basics, that we, we pay the government's wages, we generate the taxes. Um, if they interfere too much or don't listen, um, it, they, they soon will have to, because ultimately there will be no economy if we don't sort it out. So what we tell people, and um, we did have a plan B, fortunately, we... We put it in the bottom drawer and hoped we wouldn't see it, but our plan B was quite simple. We had to grow faster because uh, we knew there was going to be price pressures in our industry. Um, but I would urge people all the time, just, just make sure you've got a plan, uh, just, just so you're thinking about it. It's great to see audience like this actually thinking proactively. Even we don't know what the answers are yet, at least we're talking. Um, supply chain solutions, they do need testing for resilience. Is there a plan with your supply chain partner to deal with whatever challenges are presented to them? If they aren't considering it, they need to be urged to consider it because the, you know, the last thing you want is to start realising you've taken 12 or 18 hours out of your supply chain on something that's very perishable, and if, especially if you haven't got stock holding in the UK. Um, equally, some transport companies may not wish to enter the UK. It's what I call the submarine approach. Uh, let's leave someone else to do it for a while and we'll come back when it's all sorted itself out. Restriction on choice leads to increasing costs, which we don't really want to do with that either. Um, so taking cost, through, uh, taking cost out of the supply chain, um, there, there's a whole load of things that we can do. And, and what we're seeing, uh, I've discussed this recently, is we're not seeing any uh, change in buying behaviour from the retailers. Even though the exchange rate is, has moved so unfavourably, um, we're seeing no less deals coming in from abroad. Uh, about 45% of what we do currently is from continental Europe uh, and from Ireland. And we're seeing no, no dip in that whatsoever. Um, 
But some of the ideas that, that we are urging people to look at, there's a lot of waste in the supply chain in terms of waste is space. And just some practical tips um, to challenge yourselves and support your retail customers. Well, ultimately, you know, everyone's consumer focused because you want the consumer to buy your product. Um, things like double deckers. Uh, a lot of people try and fill pallets to the maximum height, 1.7, 1.8 meters. But there are solutions to actually get more stock on a trailer by putting less stock on a pallet. So I know we've got some height restriction here in terms of vehicle height, 4.5 meters, and you've got a tunnel, um, which, which does have a natural limitation, but that's fine. Um, Go for 1.4 meter pallets and put two of them on the truck on a ratchet system, which is the picture on the bottom right hand side shows. We see a lot of pallets which have uh, the pallets not full, so fill the pallet to the edges, reconfigure your boxes, reconfigure your packaging with a very strong um, thought process on what's your retail shelf looking like. You know, look at where your customers are in the retail and the retailers, what size shelves have they got. Um, so you can't change your box size if you're using shelf-ready packaging um, and then find it doesn't fit on the shelf. But there are better ways of filling the boxes and filling the pallets. So we've seen some remarkable increases in pallet fill with some discount retailers that we work closely with in terms of collaboration where we've taken around 40% off inbound supply chain costs into the UK and a further 60% in terms of pallet fill. Huge. If you're not holding stock in the UK, it might be something that if your shelf life allows you to, um, that you, you should consider. Um, filling trucks in, in the first trunk movement into the UK has demonstrable cost savings. Uh, and then you should be able to get, uh, we offer a, a single case rate and other people do as well. There's some very good consolidators in the UK doing what we do that can offer a fixed price case solution into any retailer. So you take away the challenges of minimum order quantities, day one, day two, uh, supply chain solutions. Um, some supply chains you just can't access from abroad. Um, you know, our latest order comes in, for example, at 2.30, 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and the truck comes in to collect that at 6 p.m. So it's, uh, it's really, really challenging. It can be done, but you need to have your stock sourced locally. Equally, if you're in chilled and your product, if you declare on your pack that you say it's uh, suitable for home freezing, then we say it's also suitable for tempering, so the reverse process. So if you've got something that is freeze stable, then um, I would argue, and we've proven this in, in a number of instances, that you can deliver around about 30% consumer price effect on shelf, even with the cost of tempering and the supply chain taken into account. So it's something to consider because you also get the 25% shelf life improvement through tempering. And that's, that's covered on this slide here, actually, because generally speaking, on Shield, you'll give... If you're honest with your retail partners, you'll give them 75% of the shelf life. Uh, most people try and keep a little bit extra. Um, but taking uh, manufacturing and freezing that product down, uh, you, you, you sort of lock it down at 100% of the shelf life, and then you release it on the chill um, with 100% of what you would have had uh, from manufacture. There's not a retailer in the land that doesn't do tempering, so it's not, you wouldn't be fighting or knocking on closed doors on that solution if it's a product or a solution that's, to, uh, that's suitable for you. A um, few points as well, and, and we're very strong on social and environmental credentials. If you look at Marks and Spencers, if anyone supplies them, um, they've got a plan A for carbon neutrality and, and to be the leader in that field, and they were, in fairness, talking about that a long time before anyone else was. Sainsbury's and Tesco do the same thing. So if they're trying to sell that to the consumers, then maybe you want to sort of tune into that as well and, and look at your own carbon and social credentials. It's, it's points of difference. It what's made you a good company and if that's the only point of difference you've, you've got between you and a German or Austrian supplier, for example, then, then use it. Um, in terms of re-engineering price uh, or re-engineering the food to a lower price point, we see, we've seen a lot of that during the last recession um, and it was challenging and you see all this really good food going taken off the shelf and then coming back and it's got all sorts of weird and wonderful fillers in there, all the sizes reduced. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a solution. It may be a way of dealing with a recession or with price points. But equally, um, the, the premium end of the market in the UK has been pretty much recession-proof. People still want good quality food, and I'd say that Ireland's got a great reputation for quality, so again, use it. Um, and something else I've, I've promoted uh, at every producer meeting I've ever gone to in, in Ireland, um, don't be afraid of using the Irish flag. I see it's a mark of quality. Um, it's Joe Public's favourite neighbour. Um, we speak the same language. We're inextricably intertwined with each other. So use that as a sales point because I think it's a quality mark. And Origin Green and what Board Beer are doing is, is, is some really good stuff in terms of the PR. Worth mentioning on this as well, 
um, in terms of dealing with um, the, the borders, I think it's going to take a long time to, to implement a hard border if one is ever approved. Um, and bear in mind, the last time we had hard borders, I mean, it's so, so long ago now that everyone who was ever involved in it is retired, or if not, they should have done. Um, so you've got a, a situation now that we've got, probably it's going to go, it'll have to go digital because of the sheer volume. And we're handling four million truck movements uh, per year into the UK. It's, it's a phenomenal amount. This is, this is going across the borders in all directions. Um, it's the devil's own task of, of actually trying to get control of that and make it work. And uh, I wouldn't want to be the one dealing with it, but ultimately some, somewhere on the line legislation will come through and, and we'll have to follow it. So ahead of that, getting uh, registered as an author, authorised economic operator I think is some low-hanging fruit that everyone can tune into. We haven't done this in the UK. There's only about 500 companies registered compared to some like 50 or 1,000 across Europe. Um, but it does get you through customs barriers quicker, so you build up trust and they recognise a lot of the background checks. It's almost like when you go to a hotel, I suppose is the analogy I will come up with, and they, they, you've been there before, you don't have to fill out all the details. If you can speed up the supply chain by um, be, becoming recognised and registered, it's got to be an advantage to you. Um, so we would urge people to do that, and we've, we've got a company that's involved primarily with um, uh, dealing with clandestine infiltration coming from uh, Calais and Dover. Um, and that is, uh, we, we, we're operating AEO service there, but we also do vehicle checks and some of the UK road licensing checks there as well. But if we can help with that, there's a, and these, these uh, slides are available after this meeting, so we've got uh, people that are very well qualified um, that, that can help with customs clearance and AEO status as well. So that slide's there for when, uh, for when it's circulated. Um, so in my summary, um, everyone is in the same boat, you know, it's, uh, we've got one exchange rate for the euro, so um, I would rather be, if I was looking to export to the UK as a food producer, I would much rather be here, uh, dare I say at the west of France and Holland and Germany, but uh, they, they've got equal opportunities. But everywhere else, I think Ireland has got the significant advantage over the rest of Europe. So the, there's, and plus you've got the quality and the, the, a lot of loyalty and a lot of love out there for Ireland. So, you know, I'd say that. Um, UK is a massive uh, net importer, so we, we, we have to keep importing food. Um, you know, if we get this, if the government gets this wrong, as James was saying, um, it, you know, empty shelves is a disaster. You know, that, there'll be nothing that invokes fear. And the press love a good story, don't they? So there's nothing that invokes uh, panic like empty shelves. We see it when, the, when it snows in the UK and you get an inch of snow on the ground and all of a sudden uh, people buy up all the bread and the milk uh, and that invokes panic. Well, the supply chain doesn't really cope with it very well. So we've got four or five hours stock holding on some lines, some of the very fresh lines, because they have so many deliveries per day. Um, so panic could be... Um, could be our friend, I'm not sure yet, we'll see. Um, but I would say get close to your supply chain partner, work with Board Beer, they do a great job. We've got an eight-year-old relationship with Board Beer and uh, utmost respect for what, what's going on um, in the, in the organisation. But use that and use your links to your supply chain partner. If you haven't got one in the UK, find one. Hopefully talk to us as well, by all means. You don't have to use us. Um, but, you know, you should be able to get ideas just walking around the warehouse. It doesn't hurt to be nosy. Um, look around the warehouses, get ideas on packaging. How is everyone else doing it? Are you over-packaging your products? Have you adopted SRP shelf-ready packaging? Are you listening to your retailers? Can you take cost out? Um, generally speaking, you know, supply chain can cost sort of between 8 and 20% of, of uh, your product on average in terms of sale price. It's worth looking at. Um, and from what we've seen, some of the worst case scenarios uh, from an inefficiency perspective, we've seen a 40 to 50% saving in supply chain. If you're not using a consolidator, then depending on your volume, you can save up to 80% on your supply chain. So it's quite significant. Get in front of your retailers, get in front of, get on the ground as well and, you know, seeing, seeing what's happening on the shelves, um, you know, <coughs> preaching to the converted, I'm sure, but be present at the buyers' meetings. They, they'd like to know that you've got a plan as well. And, and you know, I would say, I think there's a, there's a massive opportunity because, uh, you know, I, whilst we didn't want to invoke our plan B, we're on a growth curve now, we're pushing very heavily for it, we're investing in Ireland, we're investing massively in our operations in the UK because we're ready for, we're ready for the challenge now. And uh, bring it on, stay positive, your Irish should be proud of it. So thank you. <laughs>